Welcome to Electric Goddess. I'm Erica, and today I'll be interviewing our chief scientist, Luke. He's infamous for his death bike that beat a Tesla P85D on the drag strip, and also for being the kindest person in the room. Today, we invite you to listen in as we share insight into who we are and what drives our perspective on safe battery pack design. Our goal is to keep the discussion non-product specific. Humans are all on the same team with similar basic needs, and our mission is to keep our air breathable and our water drinkable. After our introduction, we'll discuss the difference between cell and battery pack failures and why it's important to design safe battery packs. Then we'll share common failures we see in battery packs and how to avoid these issues. Thanks for listening in. Learn more about us through our website, electricgoddess.co. Let's get started. Okay, Luke, how did you get into batteries? Didn't you used to be a quote unquote petrol head? <clears throat> yeah, I was uh, obsessed with internal combustion for most of my life and uh, grew up with a father who also had a father and they were, you know, all of them were obsessed with hot rodding internal combustion engines. And uh, I wanted to be a Formula One engine designer and I felt like that was the, the pinnacle of uh, the, the human life experience, you know, at, at that point in my life. And um, it was unfortunately after many years of school in thermo and fluids that it occurred to me one day, uh, no matter what I did to re reduce friction, reduce thermal conduction losses, and uh, you know, if you have perfect coatings on the faces of everything, um, you weren't going to be around 66, 65% conversion of uh, the energy in that liquid fuel you're burning to mechanical shaft power. And that means no, no matter how good of a job you do, if you, if you reach that end of the rainbow state where you've perfected every aspect, um, you'd still be generating uh, you know, around 35% heat with your energy that you're using. And when you look at electric motor designs, you quickly, really, you know, it, it becomes apparent very soon that uh, you have the same uh, magnitude of temperature limitations in materials where uh, different components fail and yet one has no defined maximum on efficiency uh, and the ranges that are practical to achieve <clears throat> today are very high and and getting even higher you know many many production vehicles today have motors that achieve over 97 um, and, and with operating ranges where they're 98 or better efficiency. And uh, it can't be understated why this is important from a performance perspective. Let's just say that all you care about is high performance and zero to 60 and quarter mile. You don't care about anything else other than high performance and quarter mile. You want that motor efficiency the most of anybody because uh, the difference between a motor that's say 96% efficient and 98% efficient, someone might say, uh, wow, it's only 2%, you know, who cares if one makes 2% more power or 2% less power. But what's underappreciated is that one is double the heat load of the other for a given amount of power, meaning if they both have the same case surface and cooling one is capable of double the continuous power of the other, which is a tremendous advantage, you know, to be double the continuous power, even though it's only a 2% difference in efficiency. And uh, as people make this, these improvements, you know, of, of low 98% becoming edging towards 99%, this is also a doubling of power density in electric motors again, as you make this, uh, transition of only a 1% change. And so, of course, from the perspective of your vehicle range, sure, it's it's a negligible change. It's 1%. Um, 
but from your vehicle's continuous horsepower perspective, it is a tremendous improvement because it's limited by waste heat capacity alone. And so when uh, I looked at internal combustion, I looked at electric motors, you know, and I realized, and even, even a really shitty electric motor um, has improved thermal dynamic performance to exceed um, the best you can optimize internal combustion to achieve. And uh, that was the point when I realized electric motors weren't the obstacle from uh, adopting um, EV, you know, a higher performance vehicles. Not not saying that my mission involved electric vehicles. My mission involved higher performance. So and, you just uh, got into batteries because you're like, I need to go faster. Well, basically, but but I also realized the motors aren't holding me back. I could buy enough motor at that time, but I couldn't buy enough battery at that time to meet my needs, and so. Uh, this is when I started packaging up RC hobby packs together. You know, first started experimenting in uh, high C rate batteries. Before this, I had only worked with batteries in industry and data centers, and uh, I kind of viewed them as stationary and, you know, interesting from the perspective that I I enjoyed what they did for the data center in a UPS, you know, to uh, buffer the power supply, but. Um, I never really looked at them from a performance perspective at that point in my life until uh, this was early two thousand. Yeah, about. yeah. I was I was dumping big money into my K twenty four nitrous and supercharged Civic at the time, and uh, had had gone through many gas cars, hot rodding them, and either totaling them, blowing their engines up many times. You know, I think just about every gas car I owned of the dozen plus gas cars that I, I blew the engine up and had to rebuild it. And some of them like three or four times I blew the engine up and had to rebuild them. And uh, I was the guy that would go to the drag strip and like, if I could get a clean pass in with my turbo car at a given boost pressure, then I would not run the same boost pressure a second time. I would run like another two PSI on the next run, you know, see if you get a clean run. And if you keep doing that, eventually you come home on a toe strap just about every day that you go to the track, you come back on a toe strap and it costs you many thousands of dollars before it works again. And uh, It must have been a really fun thing for you then when you had that electric bicycle that beat the Tesla. It was, it was great and uh, with, with internal combustion hot running, I used to joke with my friends, <laughs> I would say, uh, the reason I'm doing electric is so that I, I don't have to fix my transmission or clutch again. And they all could sympathize. They're all like, oh my God, he's right. <laughs> he won't ever have to break his transmission or clutch again because that's part of your car that uh, it doesn't help you actually do anything. All it has, it has one job, which is to not break. And they break all the time. It is, it is like a nightmare of internal combustion racing that people don't talk about a lot, but... Um, I wonder if that's design intent or not from a manufacturer's you know, standpoint. I think the manufacturer is pushed with trying to have fuel efficiency, which means small gear interfaces and small amounts of churning oil for windage losses and, and oil pumping losses. And transmissions are very lossy at low shaft load. So when you see a, uh, a spur gear to spur gear transfer, if it's at a very high power load, like full power on a dyno maximum torque, their efficiencies are good, like 99, 98, you know, 99, 98% or better in uh, each stage. However, when they're at light load, say that you're just cruising down the highway, if you overbuild your transmission to be capable of uh, big shock loads and, and shock burdens, then you needed bigger shafts with bigger bearings that had bigger drag and bigger gear face interfaces that churn more oil as they, as they move through the solution and uh, all this costs you cruise efficiency so that when your vehicle only needs say 10 horsepower to cruise down the highway at 60 miles an hour um, you end up having to uh, waste say three horsepower of just pumping and churning oil which is ultimately just why your transmission is warm when you finish a drive somewhere I like to think of you as an evangelical convert you know so much about diesel engines, gas engines, and that ability to 
have those discussions with what many people have had their livelihood in for at least 100 years, generations and generations, and kind of cross that bridge to have that discussion on why electric actually makes sense and so many different metrics, not only just the environmental factor, uh, is really amazing to me. Thank you. And you know, I, I think it's fun that almost all of my friends I know that build EV things today were friends of mine because we used to race internal combustion vehicles together, you know, and uh, support each other at different events, crewing for each other and uh, helping each other, you know, and uh, <clears throat> it's just, just been interesting to see people who only cared about acceleration, you know, end up drawn to EVs because they see the allure and they see the, uh, the uh, you know, it, Today it seems like the obvious potential, but years and you know years ago it didn't. It wasn't so obvious to everyone. The potential was there, and uh, it took some vision and it took some uh, appreciation of, of thermodynamics, I guess. And uh, you know, today, after people have set so many examples, you know, uh, the Plaid Model S being one example that uh, it's like the conversion maker. Immediately, you take. That they can, they can be the most internal combustion passionate person, and you give them one launch, one cheater mode launch in the plaid, and uh, their whole world perspective has changed. I like that it causes spontaneous giggles, <laughs> yeah, and maybe a lot of pensive thinking for others who didn't yeah. understand it before. I I love uh, especially from. People you'd never expect it because it's just like weird primal grunting noises and like, <laughs> like, like G forces that people have never experienced before. Where most people their whole life have never felt that kind of acceleration, especially that kind of sustained acceleration like the plaid. It's amazing. So being considerate of different products and pricings and things like that, what would you say is your most defining moment with working on battery when i uh when i first left school i this was this was the point in my mind in my life when batteries had the least mystery to me and i had the highest confidence that i could successfully build any pack for any application at any scale you know and i would have no problems and reasonable yeah, that was that was like my current state of delusion, Dunning Kruger curve style. And uh, I went into data centers, and you know the the packs involved in data centers are in a dry and temperature controlled and humidity controlled environment, and so you don't experience the same kinds of failure modes that you do in in say vehicles. And uh, so whatever. Whatever you put together in a data center, um, with with no particular concern for condensing humidity, let's say, and and vibration and chafing, just works provided you had acceptable cross sectional area for your interconnects, so that there's not a thermal issue from resistive heating anywhere. And that's actually you know one of I thought that was the big obstacle to battery design when <laughs> which is so funny to think about looking back, but. I thought that was the big challenge in batteries was like, how do you get a low cost, low resistance interconnect between all of your groups? Like I was really focused on that as a priority. And uh, today I, I laugh because um, that's not even 0.01% of what makes a battery pack good or not is a, uh, you know, robust low resistance interconnect. Um, how did you learn that? How did you come down that Dunning Kruger? <laughs> okay. Um, well, <clears throat> I uh, it, it's not that it's not that a low ro that a robust low resistance interconnect is a bad thing. It's just that if you focus on it as the main objective, um, what you need to be focusing on is that protecting from condensing humidity and corrosion effects is actually your number one objective. And then you work with whatever interconnect methodology enables you to uh, have successful protection of uh, 
from corrosion and, and humidity intrusion and corrosion. You know, the, the reason why uh, a lot of people think, well, corrosion, you know, like I see nuts and bolts rust sometimes, you know, like maybe the screws on my fence or whatever rusted, you know, the, the gate hinge rusted or whatever, right? But this took years and it seems to be mostly a cosmetic effect. But um, the kind of corrosion that I'm talking about is corrosion that's driven by electricity between, you know, the potential between points in the battery where uh, this string of different voltage potentials in this series group of cells, um, wherever they have an electrolyte bridge them, and this electrolyte can be dew, it can be uh, distilled water vapor, and you think, wow, but distilled water has no ions in it, it won't conduct. But the moment that water vapor is in our atmosphere, it's 400 parts per million carbon dioxide, and so it absorbs carbonic acid, which is a, a ready metal ion conductor for you know, nickel carbonates and iron carbonates, copper carbonates, aluminum carbonates. And so uh, you have the material, depending on whether you're cylindrical, pouch, or prismatic, they're all vulnerable um, to rapid electrolysis driven corrosion by these voltage potentials incurring across uh, even do even clean distilled humidity you know realistically though battery packs get exposed to uh, things like salted road spray where people drive in winter roads where it's a slushy street that's had many salt pellets saturating it and the spray off their tires makes these tiny fine droplets that shear off the boundary layer shear effects as the tire passes over the top of the tire at peak wind speed and uh, this causes a uh, cloud of micro droplets that then the vehicle's being uh, immersed through with turbulent air laden with these corrosive salt laden droplets and road spray is actually nothing like um, a salt fog test standard which is where you use distilled water and sodium chloride and, you, and it normally calls out something like 99.9% .9 reagent grade sodium chloride or something you know they're doing this because they want consistency and repeatability for anybody to run this test anywhere in the world and have identical results outcome. And so there's a benefit to running the test that way, but the reality of road salt that, that the vehicle will actually be exposed to is that uh, it road salt is the cheapest dump truck loads of salt you can mine, which is laden with uh, manganese chloride, manganese sulfate, potassium chloride, potassium sulfate, aluminum sulfate, aluminum chloride, you know, um, obviously sodium chloride, you know, which is a a leading component. Um, <clears throat> so I'm asking about you, right? Thank you for that. Well, and it sounds like you designed a battery pack. You had the metrics that were your main guiding light. Unfortunately, and yeah, you foolish. you figured out in a what sounds like a pretty rough way on the way that Earth treats batteries. And uh, with that lesson learned, it sounds like you might have been at the front of the curve there on figuring that out. Do you still see that kind of design that you designed back then being manufactured today? You know, it's it it appears visually beautiful this this topology of design and it's uh geometrically stable during manufacturing and uh, it has a bunch of really appealing advantages for uh, selecting a topology style like that and so I can't fault anyone and I selected it myself you know and uh, I can't fault anyone that that also selects it but um, knowing what I know now you know I would obviously never put pouch cells in cassettes again. And um, for the folks that are using pouch cells packaged in cassettes, you know, I would love to show you uh, what happens with our corrosion accelerating fluids, which within a few minutes, we can produce reliable results for you to uh, simulate what would have taken years of uh, occasional salt fog exposure in the wild. We can uh, produce results in about a minute 40 to uh, to three minutes is, is the typical window take.
So I remember you telling me a lot about the sleepless nights that you had when going from I released a beautiful battery pack into the design oh, yeah. to oh, yeah. oh my gosh, I am now living a Blade Runner life. Okay. Go um, down collecting them. And okay, then yeah. working through getting uh, the materials right and um, the environmental protection right. Yeah, after after having released a, a pouch cell pack and cassettes, um, I realized, wow, for my next generation, I need to uh, do my best to encapsulate this. And this is unfortunately when I thought IP standards would help me. And so uh, I used a material where uh, I was able to achieve passing IP67 using, in this particular case, it was a, a siloxin polymer. And um, it would pass submersion to under a meter, you know, for, you could even submerge under a meter for a day. And uh, it would it would functionally pass the test for for meeting the requirements and liquid water you know at that time i thought wow it's clear under a meter of water you know this is so impressive i'm so you know i'm so protected now um but unfortunately there was two effects i didn't know about that that were uh, mistakes in there and um, one was uh Liquid water, like an IP67 test, for example, um, especially submersion, you know, liquid water has surface tension wanting to keep it cohesive and together in a uniform uh, volume. And, uh, you know, this is really easy to keep out of things and see a lot of things like uh, scotch tape or a smear of silicone or, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of things can enable a product with no weather protection at all to pass an IP67 test because liquid water intrusion is so easy to defend against. Uh, turns out what is not easy to defend against is water vapor. Uh, you know, if you think about, let's say that, you know, let's say that you have a gore membrane as an example. Um, this stops liquid water so you can go through something like an IP67 test and that meter of liquid water doesn't push through the gore membrane to flood into your product with liquid water, right? And so you think, oh, this is great. Um, but the thing is, is uh, liquid water was actually never the concern in a battery. The concern is condensing humidity. And when you look at humidity molecules, you know, they are... Uh, Diatomic nitrogen is, you know, a pair of 14s at 28 and diatomic oxygen is a pair of 16s at 32. And so these are big and heavy relative to water, which is H2O. So one oxygen and two hydrogens for total molecular weight of 18. And uh, this means it's moving, you know, almost double the speed of oxygen and about 50, 60% faster than nitrogen through the air and it's a smaller radius molecule and it's highly polar on one side so that uh, depending on the kinetics of the collision, it will have uh, a sticky end to, to almost any surface depending on if you had bad luck with that collision kinetic. This means uh, water vapor condensates go through things like a gore vent preferentially over normal air so that every time your product's warm and this product cools down at a point where there's saturated humidity in the atmosphere at that time. So say uh, shortly after sunset each day on Earth, there's uh, all the uh, humidity that had been uh, evaporated by the sun hitting the surface of the Earth during the course of the day uh, begins to recondense and the, the air becomes saturated and there's dew that appears you know, at some point. Uh, you know, it, in most places, there'll be dew that happens almost every day, you know, and... Uh, I like it when this is all great, and I'm sure that some people are able to digest what you're saying. As far as saying it generally to others listening here today, I like it when you talk about 
The thing I get when I hear to a lot, a lot of our clients talk is, well, my battery pack is totally sealed. I don't have oh, a vent. Yeah. So okay. Like, okay, this is this is a great one. And I hear this almost, you know, at least every week somebody tells me their pack is sealed. And it's hard not to, like, you know, spit your gum out in laughter. But, um, you know, a seal to achieve a vapor tight seal means that, uh, you know, polymeric materials are out, ad adhesive materials are out, and, um, you know, people show you the design that the, they're telling you is sealed and it, it has a, a series of O-rings and rubber gaskets and their connectors use little uh, O-rings around the wire jackets, you know, to push into the housings and, uh, you know, rarely will, will, will there even be anti-capillary wire so that the uh, strands of the wire just free ports through the housings. You gave me an but, example once on, is a battery pack fully sealed, right? What about the pref pressure differential? If right now oh, yeah. driving a sealed a battery one. pack while we're here and driving on the PCH and then That's now right. we want to go to Mammoth, That's what right. happens? Doesn't it like That's right. it pressure That's nominal right. so, or? So uh, yeah, that's a great example, Erga, to help people see it. Um, when when you you know when someone's confident their pack is sealed, you ask them uh, when you're at sea level and you go to the top of a mountain with your pack and you drive to the top of a mountain pass. Does it maintain sea level atmospheric pressure or does it normalize when you go to the top of that mountain? Perhaps you know, and they'll they'll think about it for a while and they'll think about mine. If I even had you know half of a psi, that would be you know, 10,000 pounds deforming the skin of my battery pack, you know, so maybe I'll think about it for a minute and uh, say, oh, it, it normalizes when you go to the top of the mountain pass. And, and then... Uh, that's how when we you, say the pack breathes. Yeah, right? and so when, and then you and say, so when you go back down from the mountain pass, does it maintain the low pressure atmosphere that it experienced at the top of the pass, or does it normalize again to the, uh, you know, the standard atmospheric pressure at sea level again when you come back down and you know the, the thing that you know, it normalizes of course and that normalization of pressure is what happens every day every time even if you're not using the product when the sun shines on it and then the sun goes down you know every time the sun shines on it there's an expansion of the volume of air inside which increases pressure which causes an egress of vapor inside you know and, and gas inside and uh Every time that the sun sets, there is this um, ingress as it cools. And if your ingress cycle and your egress cycle, cycle are timed, unfortunately, then you run a one-way humidity trap where all of the free airspace in that enclosure accumulates, condensates. And unfortunately, this water vapor, when it's inside, and of course, things like a core vent don't stop water vapor, they preferentially pass water vapor, so they, they would selectively be pulling more water into your battery than if you didn't have it. But um, anyways, if in the situation, uh, every time you have the condensate portion, portion of the cycle, which is where uh, it reaches its coolest point and the humidity that was carried in the air is uh, super saturated and condensing, it wants to condense in the crevice volumes inside a battery, which are surfaces that have the most thermal conductivity and the tightest spacing. And so these spaces have the most thermal kinetic collisions with vapor molecules to touch the surfaces and absorb energy and have a chance of sticking and wetting out on the surfaces. And so um, when you ingress this condensing humidity, it wants to wet out in, you know, Things like copper pins with tight spacing it wants to wet into and uh, you know gaps between cells that are tight let's say that have a uh, series voltage between steps you know this is why uh, protecting from condensing humidity is so important and if if people go for uh, methods that use relying on a, a vapor tight <clears throat> you know let's let's call it a hermetic seal then you make a product that uh, is one pinhole defect away from a critical safety hazard being available where it can burn from a molten salt bridge from inducing corrosion that causes electrolyte leafage in the pack. And so um, 
is it wise to make a product that if it develops a single pinhole over its life um, has the potential to burn you know and it sounds like you were given an, an amazing opportunity to design a battery pack sounds like you followed the rules and by you know following those rules you got to investigate deeply into failure mechanics uh, which kind of was specifically in corrosion induced and environmental protection or non-protection yep. thereof induced I, and i think that that has been a blessing in disguise not definitely not something we'd ever want to wish on anyone yeah uh to design battery packs that are available today that are considered some of the most rugged if not the most rugged battery packs out there at, at the time that i was uh designing to meet those standards you know i wasn't actually even passing some of those tests which you know today i laugh at those tests but at the time, I wasn't even passing some of them, and I remember thinking to myself, these tests are so overkill, and, uh, you know, who who would think of, you know, these things? And um, today, of course, one, once you've learned how to protect against um, these different failure mechanics... Um, Should be tossing them off cranes. It, yeah, time. yeah. Now now I look at, look at those tests that I used to struggle to pass, and I think, like... You know, I would I would turn it up like times a factor of a hundred on on all the uh, test criteria you know today and um, but it, I I enjoy it when it's an extremely difficult challenge to try to uh, overcome uh, you know what what needs to be done and so I, I like having really high bars to jump and then making systems that jump them easily you are one of the most passionate and knowledgeable people that I know in the industry. Oh, thank you, you're too kind. And with that, I want to ask, why did you choose to work at Electric Goddess in research and development? Well, um, you know, I had been involved in uh, a number of um, companies that I had the honor of helping, and they found success through my work, and uh, I was grateful for the opportunity to contribute useful um, aid and uh, I realized there was aspects of working for companies that I enjoyed and aspects of working for companies that uh, I was poorly suited to and um, you know there's folks that uh, are really good at, at handling different parts of it but there was one area that I really shined which was overcoming technical research and development challenges that uh, were showstoppers and the things that I didn't shine at was uh, you know production related uh, and quality related uh, you know day-to-day -day concerns in in running a manufacturing process and uh, so I you know when I saw this opportunity while wow, I can focus just on the area that is really valuable to companies to have happen, which is their particular uh, challenging engineering problem overcome. And uh, I can focus all of my time on that without having to spend uh, my time divided between maybe only 10% research and development and 90% other stuff. Now I get to do 90% research and development and 10% non-research and development administrative related stuff. Wonderful. Have a like, blessed life. Yeah, for I sure. feel, feel so lucky, actually. So grateful for this opportunity. Uh, I want to ask a few introductory terminology questions just as we dive a little bit deeper into the battery design aspect of our talk. And uh, the first one is what is a cell and why are they considered generally safe? Okay. That's a great question. Um, you know, the difference between a cell and a battery, a battery is a assortment of cells that are being, uh, you know, configured in some useful manner together. And um, a cell itself is the uh, sub, you know, it's, it's the lowest electrochemical storage unit in a battery assembly. 
And uh, so my cell phone has a battery or a cell? Well, that's that's a great question because it's both in that case. You know, um, I would call it the cell in your phone, but it wouldn't be incorrect in that case to call it your phone's battery as well. Mm -hmm. You know, but technically, you know, if you wanted to nitpick, since it's not a assortment of cells unless you know that you're one of the few phones that has like two parallel cells in it but if you're not an assortment of cells you would technically not be a battery because battery implies that there was ganged cells but colloquially people refer to you know the battery even if it's one cell not a gang of cells if it's if it's what powers the device people you know, colloquially refer to it as but battery. in my tesla there's many cells there's many cells correct even though i would just call it charging the battery right? that's right that's right. Those those many cells would make the one battery that powers a vehicle, but uh, each each one of those cells you wouldn't call a Tesla battery. You would call it a, a cell. Battery. So a long time ago, and maybe not that long actually, uh, there were certain cell phones that were banned from airlines. Mm -hmm. And the reason I brought it up is we consider cells to be generally safe, right? Mm -hmm. And the amount that are manufactured and the mean time between failures. You know, but I think that's a perfect example cell. because um, in that case, it was, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I can say this publicly. I think it's been said publicly before, I but- I think um, should be careful. Yeah, uh, well, let's just say in a hypothetical world then, unrelated to this one, you know, where there's the cell phone related fire issue, you know, um, that was packaging high, tall electrical component impingement. And so that's why even swapping out all of the cells didn't fix the problem because it wasn't actually related to the cell oh, wow. in the so first place. Oh, wow, to the cell. It was a tall component impingement on the packaging. So, uh, it's it's complicated. Okay. Something sat taller on the board by uh, however amount than that was expected. Apparently, um, I didn't know that. Well, I don't know if that's that's why I said I don't know if we should talk about it, if it's public or not. But um, yeah, that's the reason why changing the cells the first time they took everybody's phone back and changed the cells to a different cell, they didn't want to compromise capacity, and so it was the same dimensions of cell roughly, which had same impingement challenges you know which is tough so what kind <clears throat> of like let's say you have i don't even know if they make these anymore like vapes electronic cigarettes that mm -hmm. you put an 18650 inside mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. uh what kind of failures or like just single cells might people see okay most of the time when those things have uh you know thermal runaway inside people's vapes it's it's either that uh well, at least the most common one probably is you put the battery in upside down and in this case they'll have a uh, buck converter power supply some have a buck and boost converter power supply and fancy vapes but uh, if it's backwards it will short power into something like maybe a 0.7 volt diode load you know or semiconductor maybe the mosfet intrinsic diode load and uh, this means the cell is uh, basically going into short circuit induced soft thermal runaway. Um, and uh, you know, this is, you could say that user error for a reverse player in the cell, you know, or you could say, uh, you know, cells could have more sensitive CIDs, but the reality is the CID- Current interrupt device. Yeah, current interrupt device. The reality is, um, the power rates that people want in vapes require that the CID uh, supports, say, 35, 40 amps, you know. And so uh, there's, an, there's an expectation that essentially if, if people want to be able to vape at, say, 120 watts from their, you know, one or two cell 18650, then um, they'll also have to accept that if they soft short circuit from something like reverse polarity installation of batteries, that nothing will be operating at over design intent current levels. It will just be uh, shorting through a MOSFET intrinsic diode, you know, in the case of reverse polarity or, or you know, there's, anyways, 
there's there's ways you could protect the circuit too, but if if you add uh, more circuit protection and then you'll add higher uh, power conversion loss in your butt converter and higher component cost for an additional for full current capable uh, switch, you know, or diode. Either either way, it costs you. Um, the MOSFET costs you in low efficiency from from less diode drop, and the diode costs you in. Uh, Efficiency and performance forward. Every time you vaped, you'd be eating, say, 0. 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 volts of loss from your three, you know, three and a half volts. So, like uh, eating to, them into your mouth, or just no, no, them? no. I just mean <laughs> eating them as heat thermodynamically in your driver as an efficiency. And so there's, you know, if people say, "Well, give me short circuit protection," you know, then you say, "Well, accept that you'll have lower utilization of your vape." and higher cost, you know. Um, so it's a trade-off right. people make with those right. single cell. Right, it's, it's like of... either either pay attention putting in polarity or have lower performance, you know, products that, uh... anyways, the, the other way that people have problems is uh, back in the day, what they called the mechanical mod was really common, which was just uh, a big high current switch with high current, high pressure terminals. Um, that would short the battery power directly into the vape coil with no conversion electronics. And uh, these were kind of like, you know, for, for a few years they were kind of considered like the only way to have really high powered vaping. But um, a lot of those mechanical mods, people would impinge on the cells until they would actually breach the housings of the cell from cell pressure contact because um, they were pretty crude. and so. If you mechanically damage a cell or if you mechanically short through the uh, upper heat shrink on the upper crimp edge, then the cell will short out between the positive terminal and the upper crimp edge. And so, um, yeah. yeah, that's definitely the risk of having just like a loose cell that the general public can interface with. Maybe I should start with asking you like a really basic question on um, what do you consider a cell? Um, a base. So I consider a cell, each group that is wetted by an electrolyte and that electrolyte is partitioned, you know, I consider that a, uh, a, a cell. And so, um, you know, yeah, yeah people, people make prismatics sometimes where they're in different bags. The jelly roll is in multiple bags that are in a prismatic housing together. And in that case, I would actually consider... You know, it's it's a fuzzy line on uh, what would be a cell, but what would you consider a difference between like a research and development cell and a production cell? Oh well, <clears throat> in a research and development cell, uh, things are made with uh, prototype materials in small batches, and they're often coded by hand or by equipment that. Uh, has very little time to set up, you know, let's say you've only got uh, 100 milliliters of, of something you need to coat, then you don't get to run hundreds of yards of foil to get like perfect coating properties. You have uh, whatever is just functional, you know, most research and development cells are minimum viable, functional, and they solve the problem of having poor manufacturing in a research and development cells by having uh, multiple in each batch with the hopes being that if one of them has good performance it's indicative that all of them could have had good performance if if you had good manufacturing you know but when we get R&D cells you know they're uh, hand taped and glued and the seams are you know crazy and uh, you know we even even when you get R and D cylindricals, you know they can arrive with the the CIDs and vents already blown, you know, because different electrolytes gas out, you know, that that are they're trying for our research, you know, and uh, anyways, it's <clears throat> yeah, research and development cells are sketchy, and that's why the public never has to deal with them, and that's why you know R and D cells have a chain of custody from the moment that they leave the lab that's dealing with them, you know, there's a responsibility that those don't get in the hands of the public. But R&D cells are incredibly useful because they let you do things like safety tests and safety qualification of different materials. 
Um, so Luke, as someone who really appreciates discovering more about our wonderful universe we have out there, do you feel like there's more left to discover in designing batteries? <clears throat> yeah, enormous potential, you know. Um, when I think about a cell, you know, um, let's say we're looking at a 2170 cell, there's something like 10.2 to 10.5 grams of steel casing. You know, there's uh, something like 6 grams of aluminum foil for its cathode, something like uh, 10, 12 grams of copper foil for the anode, and, uh, you know, none of those things are storing energy, you know, um, they don't store any energy, right? They're only providing access to the active material and uh, the percentage of active material uh, that's actually lithium being uh, changed in oxidation state to uh, store and release energy is so tiny, you know, it's, your cathode is, uh, nickel and cobalt and manganese, or nickel and cobalt and aluminum in, in these ceramic oxides uh, centered together and then uh, blended with a binder and solvent deposited to coat this, this aluminum foil. And uh, So we have wasted space with steel, essentially, well, other than the fact that it no, keeps it inside not, right now. Yeah, and I don't want to call any of it wasted right now, because if I had an idea to, to improve on their cylindrical cell, you know, like, you can't make the walls any thinner. You know, like, I would actually like them to be thicker they are today so like yeah. i'm not trying to like encourage people to go and move them yeah so let's let's not blame the steel wall but um what i what i want to do is i'll jump back into it and get back to why there's so much room for growth you know so the, the reason i see so much potential left in lithium ion batteries is you know uh, because so much of the battery today is um, the supporting structure to allow the lithium to change oxidation states between anode to cathode, you know, and the current collection uh, so that we can electrically interface with this active material that supports holding it when it's in uh, one oxidation state and then the other. Be because of this, in each cell, you know, let's say that we've got a 2170 and, and say it's uh, 68 grams or 70 grams, um, we know that, say, uh, 60 grams or so, you know, is not, you know, it's all critical. I'm not, I'm not saying that the 60 grams can just leave because I don't have a better way to do it than what they're doing right now either. But um, those 60 grams are not storing electrochemical energy for you. Those 60 grams are the supporting infrastructure for electrochemical energy, kind of like if you had, uh, you know, if, if it wasn't a battery, it was like a circus or something, you could say, uh, you know, these these circus acrobats or whatever, you know, if you're a circus acrobat show, then these circus acrobats are, you know, you've got two dozen guys that are circus acrobats, let's say, and then you've got, say, 2,000 people that are support and logistics to get these agrobats around and to have them uh, stored and safe in one side and to be able to transport to the other side and be stored and safe on the other side. You know? And so this is why uh, there's so much room to improve. You know, if, if we were at a point <clears throat> where say 50% uh, of that 70 gram 2170 was already lithium mass that we were changing oxidation states in, you know, then it would seem like a very grim future to get into battery development, cell development, you know, um, because you'd say, wow, you know, the best I could do is uh, hope to approach a doubling if you had, you know, perfect unity with no parasitic overhead for what you were packaging, you know, which is totally impractical. But, you know, it would mean that there was very little room to grow. But since we're at, you know, say the uh, one or two percent range, then it means your room to grow, let's say, towards approaching 50% utilization of your 2% utilization, it means that there's room to grow by, like, say, 25x if, if you could reach those systems. And, of course, um, people will say, oh, well, you could never achieve, you know, 50% utilization. But um, 
I agree with you. If you're doing what you're doing today, you could never achieve 50% utilization. But um, people have shown uh, if you have atom precise metamaterials that uh, you know store lithium and interpolate lithium, there's actually uh, basically the the electrochemistry and the electrochemical potential is possible to. Uh, I didn't mean a pun there with potential. Uh, it's possible. I've heard some people have had their ribs broken in your life for making puns. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm actually yeah. like hearing, and this is amazing, I've actually been watching so much Stargate lately, uh, just from over the holidays, and then now I like to get an episode in every once in a while because I'm a huge Tuke fan. Uh, but what I'm hearing is that it would be cool to have some sort of like crystalline or like meta material where it's like, okay, now I just dump this energy storage material into it. And essentially we start just kind of eliminating the need to hold it into smaller cases. Well, that would be, that would be awesome if you could do it at a macro crystal scale. I was, I was picturing uh, at a nano crystal scale. The reason being that there's usually, with these uh, materials that have really high utilization ratios, there's usually an enormous volumetric change. Mm. And so uh, with larger crystals, the volumetric change can be really difficult to uh, package and reliably electrically interconnect with you know, because it wants to uh, pull away when it contracts and break electrical connection. And uh, I've seen you know, some really promising, um, you know, unpublished test results showing uh, some nanomaterial structures, in including silicon nanomaterial structures, um, <clears throat> support checking, you know, I'm trying to, trying to not say too much, but support checking all the right boxes with respect to uh, high energy density, high utilization ratio efficiency, and cyclability while they're in um, very fine, uh, yeah, I guess So the future fine, is fine very structure. bright for uh, the development of cells and we're gonna see a lot of things basically come up in the next few years uh, that may or may not be scalable, right? But at least we'll get a direction on uh, the future of cells and Battery technology. Well, yeah, the the silver bullet, you know, today, so many people have made cells that, you know, while we did this um, CVD process and we applied these different layers a few atoms at a time, you know, and uh, we made this um, portion, you know, this, this uh, stack up for a coin cell that has phenomenal performance metrics and longevity and, and checks all the boxes. But uh, those cells don't have a lot of commercial value yet until um, they can be made in less than like, you know, multiple days of uh, different expert technicians minding these different uh, complicated CVD processes to make a coin cell at the highest amount of uh, the material, you know. So it's like, uh, Unfortunately, in batteries, you have to not only be better with respect to how much energy you store and uh, you know often cyclic capacity and safety as well, but you also have to be cost sensitive if you're going to work in automotive at all, at least. There's places where you don't have to be cost sensitive, like uh, space and aerospace and... Defense. Sure. And... Uh, consumer devices as well with, um, <clears throat> let's say you have a smartwatch. You know, if, if your whole battery is going to be two watt hours, it's not particularly cost sensitive if you're using a technology that's $10 a watt hour or even $20 a watt hour. If you have a two watt hour battery, um, that 20 or $40 cost in a, say a $300 smartwatch is not such a burden if, say, that using that technology gives you some compelling advantage, say, that your runtime goes up by 50% or your charge speed or, you know, whatever, 
whatever compelling advantage you've got. And so I, I think that we'll see these uh, awesome breakthroughs in you know leveraging metamaterials and exotic manufacturing processes probably first in the smallest of cells. And on that topic, I think you'll also see uh, solid electrolytes most likely first not in automotive but in applications that have very low C rates as a normal use. For example, uh, if your cell phone has a cell in it that can only discharge at uh, one third C so that you know you can you can't drain your cell phone battery faster than three hours safely, you know. Does this particularly impact anyone's use case? You know, is anyone uh, trying to drain their cell? You know, maybe there's some cell phone with a big processor and a big screen. You put it on max brightness. You know, like use all the power and you can drain it in three hours. I'm not. I'm not trying to say there's not a phone that could do it, but I'm saying, um, if if you have a technology that is limited to a third C rate, the cell phone market is there for you. You know, and the laptop market is there for you too. You know, sure. It, there's laptops that can drain their battery, you know, gaming laptops can drain their battery in, in an hour or whatever, let's say, but most people's laptops that they're buying today and tablets that they're buying today have, you know, say three hour, five hour, eight hour, 10 hour battery life. And so these applications are friendly towards low ionic pathway impedance cells uh, first ahead of automotive where in automotive people want there's an expectation for high horsepower and high acceleration rates, and uh, these make these uh, intrinsically difficult to make fast ion conductor electrolytes uh, suffer. You know when they're when they're burdened with a uh, high rate application. But um, I'm totally excited to see the futures of cells and where that goes. Me too. Uh, as far as the wonderful people that I get to interact with on a daily basis at my job. I speak to many people who have great ideas, uh, but need energy, need power, need a battery in their pack. Um, and I speak with a lot of people where there might not be resources too much out there uh, on the internet uh, that kind of cover some of the things that we've seen and the risks of building a battery pack on it after just Googling how to build a battery pack online. And oh. I, I think just to keep the conversation light and positive here, what would you say are some general mitigation strategies that you would say, if you were gonna build a battery pack and you needed to tell someone, just make sure you do this, um, how can the average Joe make sure that the batteries are safe? My first thing would be, average Joes, please don't build batteries. Not yet. You know, well, I would I would say something like, because uh, I was I was one of those average Joes building batteries, and uh, and I remember I, seeing fires. Yeah, I learned I learned some hard lessons. Um, have some scars, you know. Um, arc flash being a major risk, you know, not even not even the fire potential, but uh, arc flash alone. Yeah. But, um. Joe's and Jill's. And they, just to clarify. Okay. What was that? Okay. Um. So, as a hobbyist, um, you know, or, or uh, as an enthusiast, let's say, that wants to build a battery pack, um. It's a way better term than yeah. I was using. Thank you. I would I would focus on, uh, you know, obviously on safety as your number one priority. With with the focus on uh, never make if if you have any decision making point in your pack build where you say I could do this, and it would probably be more safe, or I could do this and it would be, you know, easier or faster or lower cost, whatever you know. Um, you really owe it to yourself at every opportunity to make the decision for more safety um, the reason being that for uh, the typical enthusiast the best and I'm not trying to make fun of them because I've been there you know but the best that you can think of to build a battery and protect a battery depending on the application for it you know 
uh, high vibration and resonance, uh, road fog, you know, uh, road salt spray rather, and uh, condensing humidity. Uh, these things are such formidable challenges and material compatibility. You know, an enthusiast won't have the budget to be able to uh, have built, you know, if they want to make one pack per se their electric bicycle, you know, as an example, having built many electric bicycle batteries, right? I never bought 10 times the amount of cells that I needed for one pack, and I never, uh, you know, built a series of thermal runaway propagation small scale modules to validate that my cell spacing was right and my you know, potting was right and my space was right, you know, and I, I didn't build packs that were sacrificially tested to validate that they were safe in uh, nail penetration and crush and, and shock, you know. I, in fact, just bought maybe five more cells than the minimum amount I needed to complete the pack, and those were just in the event I damaged any during the build process, you know, I would have spares, right? And, uh, you know, retrospectively, you should probably get even more spares than that. But So just wear some leathers and create a path that if there was any issues that it doesn't spray molten metal onto any part of your body that you care about. Well, <clears throat> something I found about with cells is uh, even when you think, ah, oh, the vent path is here, you know, the, the hot gas is going to go here and I've left this big passage for it to go here. It very often just, you know, say it just side ruptures and just plasma hot knives right through millimeters of stainless or mild steel or aluminum. When it had a vent path, you know, it had what whatever it had right near it, you know, that it could have gone through. But um, cells and plasma cutter temperatures, you know, if you have combustion limiting your uh, temperatures, let's say that you're a rocket engine, you know, you know that if you burn, uh, say, methane, oxygen, or hydrogen, oxygen, or kerosene, oxygen, you know that no matter how you burn these, you know, no matter how you design a better combustion chamber, you know, a better reactor, you know, nozzle, whatever, whatever, however you're burning them, calorimeter, you won't exceed their combustion flame temperature limits, which is based on the heat capacity of the molecules and the total joules of energy released when that combustion, you know, when that oxidation reduction, you know, energy release occurs, right? And so uh, this is why um, no matter how hot you make your acetylene, you know, how, how cool of a nozzle you put on your, uh, your torch, you know, that's burning propane oxygen, you know, acetylene oxygen, whatever, you'll be capped for your upper temperature. But when a cell is burning, you have electrically driven plasma energy, you know, and fire, even, even a cigarette lighter flame, conducts electricity readily, you know, it's easy enough to test for people at home, but... Um, so one, avoid fire. Well... And <laughs> how are you saying to avoid fire? I'm saying, um, you were saying make a pack where it wants to direct the fire not into uh, body parts that you care about. Um, and I'm saying the, the type of plasma that the batteries, you know, the energy from the cells being released, particularly when you have uh, side ruptures, you know, which is like a, a propagation of all the materials in the cells, you know, in, in a sudden event, um, the temperatures are way above combustion temperatures. It, with with combustion effects, the hottest you'll ever achieve is, you know, don't quote me on it, something like uh, 3,500 C or 4,000 C or something. And no matter how cool of a torch or how cool of a, of a jet engine or a rocket engine, you know, whatever you make, you won't get hotter than those temperatures. But the moment you add electricity, um, you can reach tens of thousands of degrees, you know, even hundreds of thousands of degrees. And this is why things like a, a metal cutting plasma cutter work so quickly to cut through things like conductive metal so fast. And so this is why uh, when, a, when, a, when cells are undergoing thermal runaway in someone's battery pack, particularly DIY pack, you know, or anyone's pack, uh, 
the direction, you know, and the heat path of the hot gases will be determined. Uh, the, there will be a significant fatalistic aspect to uh, where the location of event origin began and whether that was prone to causing side rupture and whether that side rupture is facing another cell. And if, if that chain of events is, uh, is the case, you know, with your pack, then uh, unless you've done a great job at selecting the right materials and the right cell spacing, you know, you will, you will have a fireball with your pack, but. So enthusiasts, uh, just kind of starting there, I don't think we have too much time to get into like what an EV maker would uh, I'm not gonna. Look out I'm for. not gonna impose anything on enthusiasts because that would be bad advice to give people. Either way, you know. Yeah. All I can do is say uh, batteries are merciless. So you, you know, all, all you, all I can do is give you awareness of the devil you're dancing with. You know, since batteries never turn off their electricity, there's never a time where they're like, oh, I'm fine having this humidity condense in me, or I'm fine with this. Uh, you know, this chafing, you know, and this uh, dielectric being worn through, you know, there, there's never a point where the battery is uh, chill, you know, or, you know, neutralized, let's say. And so because of this, um, the pack design needs to be, you know, in, in my opinion, validated for, you know, I, I do five different point initiation thermal runaways and validate that it needs no firefighting prevention and no external, you know, extinguishing methodology. You just have, you know, you either eat five three-inch nails or you do five overcharged cells or five over-temperature initiation points in the pack and uh, it passes needing nothing more, you know. So in, if it was in your garage at home, you wouldn't have to replace your house. You know, you would have perhaps some, some smells in your garage, you know, that you would want to deodorize and that would be the the event in and uh i'm hearing battery pack design needs to be more geared towards the real world versus versus the ideal right where we know that somebody on an e-bike is might throw their bicycle while delivering a pizza into into the fountain of some rich person's home and then pick it up and drive it down the street. Well, it's the but it's someone that, who's uh, designing that pack may say no one would ever throw a bicycle into the ocean or it's, whatever. Yeah, it's that it's that let's say that the guy's trying to just do the best job he can, but he puts his kickstand down and it's loose soil and it's near the fountain. You know, like I actually had my zero submerge its handlebars in Micah's koi pond in his front yard because that's that's a friend of mine, but um I, I visited his house and I parked and I put my kickstand down and I went inside and when I came out at the end of the night, um, my bike, the kickstand had pushed into his lawn probably as, as dew settled, you know, and my bike fell over with the handlebars submerged in his pond. And so, uh, you know, it could have just, if I had parked closer, could have just as easily had, you know, the battery submerged in his pond and I wasn't even trying to test it or validate anything, you know, I was just being a normal user. so. It's, it's not even the case where it's from abuse or neglect. Luke, I've learned so much talking with you today, and I'm really grateful for the information that you've shared with us and our audience here. I want to end the question or end the conversation that we have today after learning about cells are generally safe from production suppliers. A lot of things can go awry when you start interconnecting them and placing them into products. Uh, we need to make sure that you have the design considerations for safety as kind of the number one priority when it's environmental protection, cell spacing, making sure that it fails safely. Um, so what would you tell yourself 10 years ago when you started in this battery journey? Well, 10 plus years ago, actually, for you. You know, uh, what would you tell yourself as you are today? I, Ironically, uh, well, it, it would be so priceless if I could talk to myself 10 years ago. Uh, I, mean, I hope you have amazing. a time machine for you soon. You know, I wouldn't want to do anything that would risk me not meeting you and having uh, the opportunity for this life together. Thank you. When I started in batteries, you know, I was uh, kind of ironically concerned about things like 
defects in cells, let's say, I thought that was, you know, one of my big risks that I was confronting. And the reality was um, cells are great and have been so great for so long. Um, not to say that there there weren't particular instances once or twice, you know, where, where there have been cell defects, but um, the way that you package cells and, uh, you know, if, for example, if, if you don't have either something that's encapsulated monolithically and completely so that there's no expansion and contraction volume of uh, free space inside the assembly to accumulate humidity and condensates, or you've got a uh, true vapor and gas tight enclosure, which means you're not using plastic anywhere, and you're not using rubber O-rings and seals or anything anywhere, you know. Um, you know that, that looks like a laser welded, uh, say a laser welded stainless enclosure that has only ceramic furnace brazed pass-throughs that get laser welded into the housing, you know, and, and this makes a hermetically sealed enclosure, you know, like like how a contactor's movable element cavity is, you know, constructed today. And uh, if, if you make that hermetic seal, you know, then it can last. But um, I would I would tell myself, please stop functioning, you know, to stop focusing energy on uh, trying to make that seal and make that seal maintain integrity over the life of the product for the reasons that uh, people scratch things on rocks, you know, on the bottom of their car and, you know, all, all kinds of weird things happen, road debris and uh, things fly up and hit stuff, you know, and chip through your corrosion protection coatings, you know, and all, all kinds of things that you thought would be such a good solution, you know. Uh, it's amazing what a good rock scraping across something with the weight of the vehicle at highway speeds will do to uh, something that you thought was a good solution. Um, I've had a phone once with the screen that went across the road. That was pretty brutal. Yeah. <laughs> Would you say anything about material selection or? Yeah, you know, um, once, you once you realize that you need to uh, either have a hermetic seal and maintain integrity of the hermetic seal, or you need, you know, or ha suffer the outcome of being a liquid tight but not vapor tight enclosure which is where you'll accumulate condensates inside like a one-way humidity trap until eventually you'll fail from um, probably a molten salt bridge and fire but in your best case scenario you have isolation and balance issues you know cause pack fail failure before that yeah you like fail gracefully it would be your best case scenario um, when you encapsulate and protect the materials you know when when i first did this early in my career um I selected a material that I got, um, you know, from from one of the top five, uh, let's say, adhesives and sealant makers in the world. Um, I had engineering support, you know, that this particular siloxin was a non-corrosive and electronics grade material, you know, and this would be uh, a good idea to use in my application. And uh, I trusted that advice and Unfortunately, this is where, again, standards can be so misleading because they, I trusted this advice because they showed me, hey, it passed these ASTM and SAE material compatibility tests with all of the things that it's in contact with, and it has good adhesion strength with all of the surfaces that it's in contact with for your application. And so, uh, you know, I, I looked at these properties and I said, wow, it's it's great and they've already validated it and they've even got five year and 10 year samples validating this material, you know, with everything that it's in contact with. So I, I felt really good that it had, you know, I checked all the, dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's with due diligence, you know, and um, turns out, as we later found out, um, in the presence of electrostatic field stress, so in the case of batteries, you know, there's, Every series junction over makes one more hop increasing, you know, 3.7 volts nominal or 4.2 fully charged. And uh, this means there's always electrostatic field stress distributed throughout the pack assembly. And the crazy thing with this example was it would migrate, it, it was something called an oxamine complexation of copper. 
and it would migrate these uh, complex coppers uh, at a macro scale, you know, that were visible with the microscope. You know, we, we measured the size of these little balls. They were spherical, too. It was really weird. But it would migrate these copper nodules right through the siloxin material, crazing it and splitting it along the path that it moved, you know, and... Uh, that sounds pretty gnarly. Yeah, it would cause complete loss of material integrity and structural, mechanical, and humidity, you know, protection integrity. That's and pretty so, important to choose the right adhesive and test it in the application. That's right, and, and this is why now, every time I use an adhesive, you know, uh, so many materials in the epoxide family um, will break under voltage stress and time, um, and they'll break by migrating ions through them between the junction, either from the cell into the, the base plate, the cooling plate, when, you know, whatever it's going to do, or, or vice versa. But, um, you know, we perform material voltage stress um, and breakdown stress, and the, the good news is there's families of materials out there that uh, have little to no tendency. You know, we, we can still measure something, but it's, uh, say, many orders of magnitude lower effects observed than uh, than some other effects. And this is, uh, you know, really great because this gives our clients pathways forward to avoid having the same electrostatic field stress related degradation of their dielectric materials. You know, I would also tell myself if, if I could talk to myself 10 years ago, I'd tell myself, hey, these dielectrics, when you read these data sheets and it says, uh, you know, it's this many giga ohms per millimeter, you know, um, understand that those values are when it's just made in a dry environment. And once they've saturated with humidity, which they will perhaps before they've even arrived from shipping to you, just from not being packaged in a humidity free environment, you know, um, and they're permeable to humidity and you know, all polymers, even fluoropolymers are permeable to humidity. Um, so once they're saturated with humidity, these dielectric values, you know, they went from giga ohms per millimeter, you know, they, they go to uh, you know, mega ohms per millimeter, and, and sadly, sometimes hundreds of kilo ohms or even tens of kilo ohms per millimeter, you know, some, some nylons really have large drops once they're saturated with humidity. And so if you're uh, building your design and you're measuring your uh, dielectric strength and you're assuming you have these values on the data sheet, you know, sadly, you you need to saturate every sample you've got in humidity. You know, I, I use high pressure steam, but um, thin test with your own breakdown and you'll find, um, you know, drastically different results. And you'll find, um, if you see the signature of ionic migration in your stack up, so I, I look for the current signature when I'm putting high voltage stress across, across the dielectric. And if I see a irregular and erratic current signature, this is my sign. Uh, I'm, I've got uh, ionic processes happening. And my other sign is when I change polarity of this field strength across the dielectric, I see a difference in the current. And, um, you know, this tells me uh, something's asymmetrical. I don't have a true R. I have a uh, pseudo ionic R in my true R component that I need to understand because those ionic R's mean you have a uh, one-time primary battery effect charging and discharging somewhere. You have uh, ions being ripped off of some surface somewhere, you know, and it may be metal that is your cooling plate interface. It may be the can floor that you're relying on for electrolyte containment, but... Uh, Luke, it's always a pleasure, and I love to speak with you, and I'm so excited for this series that we're doing to get our knowledge out there um, into the world to help others that are starting the same journey you started 10 years ago. I mean, 2022 is 10 years, uh, at least for this particular EV battery. Yeah, it's been 10 years of EV batteries with six years of data center batteries before that, so. That's amazing. That's really amazing. 16 there's so many items in this conversation that I would love to just double click into, right? Like each one of the subjects that you brought up is an hour conversation at a minimum, really, on how I see it. And if you've enjoyed listening in today, uh, let's be friends. 
please subscribe to Electric Goddess and connect with us on social media so that you can be notified of our next media release. Thanks for watching, fellow cosmic beings, and we'll see you next time.